Oh, come on. It's not the end of the world. Oh, maybe it is. Jesus told us to watch for signs of the times. <clears throat> and in our text of Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus has been showing his disciples what would happen in the last days. And we find ourselves now living in days where these things are happening. <clears throat> these are troublesome times, but for the believer, not troublesome times. For the believer, these are exciting times. I'm happy to report one more time today that we, today, it is September 17th, in the year of our Lord 2023 might be living in the year of our Lord. We today are closer to the return of Jesus Christ than any humans in all of history. These are exciting times in which we live. We need not run around with headline hysteria. We must simply do what Jesus told us to do, which is look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Also, we are to look around us at fields that are white unto harvest and share the good news of the gospel with people so they can be saved before it's too late. In Matthew 25, Jesus talks about separating the sheep from the goats, something that he will do in the end of the world. This is after the rapture. This is at the end even of the tribulation. So we're fast forwarding quite a bit here. He will do what he calls separating the sheep from the goats. And it's not what would Jesus do? It's what will Jesus do with you? What will Jesus do with you in the end of the world? And the answer depends on what you do with Jesus now in this day. What you do with him in this life determines what he has to do with you in the next. And so we are in Matthew 25, and I want you to look with me in verse number 31, please, which says, when the Son of Man, that's Jesus, shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, there shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. I want you to see, number one, with me, the coming of the Sovereign. The coming of the Sovereign. And He sits upon His glory throne that we just read about in verse 31. Now imagine Jesus sitting upon His glory throne. He's there today, and even when everything seems to be going wrong around us in these troublesome times, He's still on the throne. And one day soon, He will stand up from His throne. Imagine the scene as Jesus, who is sitting on his throne, stands up and comes down. And the Bible says we will rise up and we will bow down. Verse number 32 is next. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his, say it with me, sheep from the goats. Yeah. Down in verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you from the foundation of the world. He se separates into two groups, and he says to one of these groups, Enter now into heaven. Now this judgment, this very judgment, was prophesied in the book of Joel. It was written of in the book of Joel, which in Joel 3 it says, I will gather all nations and there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. It was prophesied that this would happen. And Matthew 25, Jesus tells us that it will happen. In Revelation we will see that it happens as well. And it's going to happen. We will all stand before God one day and be judged. If you're not saved, you get judged for your sins. If you are saved, thank God your sins have already been judged on the cross of Calvary. But you will be judged for your service when you stand before God. You know, today everybody's got their opinion of Jesus. 
Lots of different opinions out there, lots of different thoughts, lots of different belief systems. You could say that today men sit in judgment. Today men sit in judgment of Christ, but one day all will be judged by Christ and stand before him. Let her be the gathered masses we see in verse number 32, these gathered masses. In Bible days, it was not uncommon for sheep and goats to be herded together. Sheep in the Bible are a picture of God's people, saved people. Psalm 100 verse 3, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The Bible refers to God's people as sheep. But goats in the Bible are a picture of the lost, a person who still needs to be saved, those who have not yet been born again. And to this day, devil worshipers use the symbol of the goat and the goat head specifically. Now, we in our world today, we put people into different categories. We put people in categories of, you know, they're rich or they're poor or they're educated or they're uneducated or they're black or they're brown or they're white. But in God's eyes, there's only one division between mankind, and that is you are either saved or lost. You're either a sheep or you are a goat. This is the division in God's economy. Jesus is the one who said, you are either with me or you are against me. You're a believer or an unbeliever. You've been born again or you have not been. And you are either going to heaven or to hell. Now today, everyone's mixed together. No separation. Today, the saved and the lost are mixed together, working in the same factories. Mixed together, shopping in the same stores. Mixed together, attending the same schools all intertwined in the same neighborhoods, but one day soon, a separation is coming. We just read about it in our text. God will separate one group from another, the sheep from the goats. If that line of separation were to be drawn today, which group would you be separated unto? Which side would you be on? Would you be one of the sheep or one of the goats, and somebody says, don't worry about me, preacher, I'm a Baptist. Oh, yeah? That doesn't answer the question. You know why? Because there's two kinds of Baptists. There are saved Baptists and lost Baptists. There are Baptists that are sheep, and I promise you, there's some old goats. And we don't know who they are. We cannot tell the difference. We are not the judge. We don't sit on the throne. It's God's job to judge who is saved or not. You can fool me. You can fool everyone. But you can't fool God. And on that day, when our God separates the sheep from the goats, you will not be able to pull the wool over his eyes. The coming of the sovereign we read about in these first couple of verses. And it is followed now by the celebration of the saints. We just read in verse 34 where he says, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Uh, look here, please. This is an invitation. When he says come, that's an invitation to come. God's always been inviting people to come to him, come to Jesus. Many of today's churches are trying to bring Jesus down to people's level. Why? Because the people won't come to Jesus. So we try to bring him down to them. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, to bring God down to man's level. The invitation has always been, come unto me. Jesus said it. The invitation has always been for man to come to where God is. God has already come to us. Why? Because we couldn't get to him, but he made a way. And through Jesus' blood on the cross, we can come. And now the ball is in our court. And he offers to us, come. The invitation he gives to us, come to me. You remember God gave that invitation Back in the story of Noah's Ark, God told Noah and his family to come 
into the ark of safety. It was an invitation. Genesis 7, 1, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. God used Isaiah to invite people to come, to come to the place of cleansing. Isaiah 1, 18, he said, Come now, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you'll just heed the invitation, RSVP, say yes and come unto me. That's the invitation. Jesus invited specifically people to come to him and find rest Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, say it with me, church, and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus today if you need to. Come forward today at the invitation, and you'll be answering God's personal invitation for you to come to him. And you'll enjoy safety and cleansing and rest, become one of the sheep, not one of the goats. An important question that I must ask you this morning, what on earth would you want to go to hell for? I mean, I'm not just saying what on earth, I'm saying what is there upon the earth that would be worth an eternity in hell? would make that worth it. If you come be saved today, in that day you'll be told to come to the celebration. At the end of verse 34, he said, come inherit the kingdom. Then it says this, prepared for you, from when? From the foundation of the world. It was prepared for you from the beginning of time? Uh, this means that long before you were born, God had you in his heart? He knew your name before your parents named you? He knew all of your inward parts before there were parts? That's right. Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He loved you long before you came into existence. And God says to you today, I love you and I always have. And hell was not made for you. So don't choose to go there. Don't choose to go to a place that was never intended for you. Let's prove it. Look down in verse 41. You're in Matthew 25. Verse 41. He's, he's separated these two groups and then shall he say unto them on the left, see on the right he told them to enter into heaven, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, the goats, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting, boy my eyes are getting bad, can somebody read the next word for me? Fire, that four letter word. Everlasting fire, and then it says prepared for who? Who? It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Prepared not for you. It was not intended for you. It was pre prepared for the devil and his angels. <clears throat> and yet the Bible makes it very clear that if we don't follow Jesus, then by default we are a follower of the devil. You don't have to be a devil worshiper to be a follower of the devil. All you have to do is not follow Jesus. And if you insist on following the devil, then you follow him to hell, his ultimate demise. This means that if you end up in hell, don't miss this, ladies and gentlemen. If you end up in hell, it will be against God's will. It is not his will that any should perish, 2 Peter 3, 9, but that all should come to repentance, and yet some will not do his will. Some will not say yes to him. Some will not allow him to save their soul. And will end up in hell, because sin must be paid for. 
So we've seen the coming of the sovereign and see him sitting there on his throne as he divides the sheep from the goats. The celebration of the saints on the one side, but the cursing of the sinner is what we're talking about now. Number three, the cursing of the sinner. Go to verse number 46, please. The last verse in the chapter. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. What is hell? Hell is a place of separation. Separation. Notice the words in verse 41, the phrase, depart from me. Separate yourself from me. Be separated away from me. Get away from me. Hell is separation. It's not annihilation. Some think, oh, so you go to hell and you burn up. No, it's not annihilation. We can read several places in Scripture about the everlasting nature of hell, including the glimpse of hell we are given as we peer in in Luke chapter 16 and see a man there tormented in the flame forever and ever, including in Revelation where it says that they will be there forever and ever. The worst part of hell may not just be the fire, as bad as that would be. And though it is a literal furnace, the worst part has got to be the separation. Separation from everything that is life unto everything that is death. Separation from God Separation from everyone else. The worst pain that Jesus endured on the cross, the Bible indicates, was not the nails, was not the thorns, was not the beating. It was when the sins of the world were laid upon him and his own father turned his back on him. And that's when Jesus cried out in the greatest torment, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? or separated me from you, cut off. That's because Jesus took our hell for us. Hell is separation. Hell is condemnation. Notice in verse 41, ye cursed. When you're cursed... That's a permanent thing. It means there's no second chance. It means you're condemned. Condemnation. You know, one of the most precious verses, perhaps the most precious verse in the Bible, is the one we have on the wall over here. Let's read it aloud together, please. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's just two verses later that it says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but get this, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You're existing under that curse, that condemnation. And only the cross of Christ can break that curse. And only now, today is the day of salvation. Hell is a place of separation, a place of condemnation, and clearly a place of excruciation. Some people say, I don't believe it's a literal fire. I think it's just a, a figurative fire. Well, for one thing, the Bible makes it clear that it's literal. And what the Bible says, I believe. But let's say it's only figurative. Isn't that figurative of something really bad? <laughs> fire? If it's figurative of something, it's really bad. So let's not miss the main point. And yet it is a literal fire. An excruciation. And some say, I just don't believe that. I believe God is love. And I don't believe that God would send somebody to a place of eternal excruciation. Maybe it will surprise you to hear me say, I don't believe that either. 
I don't believe God would want to send someone to that place. And God doesn't send people to hell. They send themselves by rejecting the offer of salvation. Jesus did all that was necessary to keep us out of hell. If only we would grab onto the life preserver. Imagine him throwing it out to you and bloop, there it lands. And it's right beside you. Will you grab on or not? Would a loving God send a person to hell? No. The loving God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for sinners. So they would not have to go to hell. That's what the loving God did. But He's not just a God of love. He's a perfect, sinless, pure, holy God. He cannot even look upon sin. He's so holy. He cannot allow sin into His presence. Our sin must be paid for. And Jesus paid for your sin so you wouldn't have to go to hell and pay for your own sins. Am I preaching the gospel truth today, church? This is the truth that will save your soul. Sin has to be paid for. It must be judged. Accept Christ's payment on your behalf or Go pay for your own sins. Doesn't seem like the wise choice. It's in Revelation 21 that it says, There shall in no wise enter into heaven anything that defileth. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That is, if you've been saved. Born again. Jesus is coming. The signs of the times are everywhere. Now is the time to make a decision. Though we could have years, we may only have seconds. Jesus is coming. Be ready. If you're not saved, you better get saved. Jesus is coming. If you've been saved but you've not been right, you better get right. Jesus is coming. Get back into church. I mean really back into church. Jesus is coming. Be witnessing. Share the good news with others who need to be saved. Jesus is coming. Be watching for Him. Don't be surprised and don't be caught looking at the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Be found faithful when He returns. Jesus is coming. Be working for Him. We are saved to serve, not saved to sit and soak and sour. Saved to serve. He's worthy. He's the King. WWJD, what will Jesus do? With you. Which group will you be separated unto? Where will you spend eternity? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, I fully realize that most everyone that I'm talking to has already been saved. Perhaps who God is talking to right now is that one who needs to be saved. Who still needs to be saved. He's looking at you right now from above. Saying, I died for you. I took your hell for you. I love you. I want to save you. Will you say yes to him? Getting saved is simple. Do you believe? You could tell God right now in a prayer what, it need, what you need to do in order to be saved. You can just say, God, I believe. Say it right now if you need to. I believe that you love me and that you died for me. I'm a sinner. I admit it. My sins must be paid for. And I don't want to pay for my sins in hell. I want to accept your payment in my place on the cross. Thank you for loving me enough to do that for me. And then rise again on the third day. Just say, God, I believe. And I ask you now to forgive me of all my sins. Erase them. Save my soul right now. 
take me to heaven when I die. Now thank the Lord for saving you. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved on the authority of God's word. Ladies and gentlemen, if you just asked him to save your soul, he just said yes, and you can say thank you. And now, Lord, help me live my life for you before the end of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, instead of bowing our heads and closing our eyes, at this time I want to introduce you to a young man. In a little bit he's going to be baptized, all right? Come on up here and stand with me, buddy. Oh, he's even got his bag all ready. This is Josh Miller. Josh, was it in this room when you got saved? That's when I like, made sure I was. Made sure that you were saved? It was 